all for coming. Uh, thank you, Martin Fletcher, who I had the privilege of interviewing on the radio. And now it's great to interview him in person. Thank you. Um, so your book, Promised Land, has been compared uh, to Exodus by Leon Uris. Uh, I'm not sure you, uh, you like that comparison. <laughs> but, um, but it really is a, a sweeping epic uh, in the way that Exodus is, and, and in this case, in the, the early days of the state of Israel. And it, it clearly comes from a, a deep knowledge of Israel and, and a, a passion. The passion comes through. But when you were growing up in London, I don't know that anybody would have mistaken you for a strong Zionist. Tell us about your Jewish upbringing. Uh, basically, absent. <laughs> um, it was a very Jewish home in the sense that my family, my parents came from Vienna, and they got out of Vienna in the early 39, and most of their families were killed in the Holocaust. So my, my Jewish upbringing in, in, in England, in London, you know, my home was a very dark kind of place in one sense because uh, my father, every, every few days, would light a, a yard site list, a memorial candle to somebody. This was the, this was, this was the day that, uh, that your Elisa was sent to my day. This was the day that, so there's always an anniversary of something. But, but what I re only realized a, little, a few years ago was that my father would take my brother and me into the next room and light the candle and say the prayer. Not once did my mother come with us. And I only suddenly I only noticed that a few years ago. And so it was just very hard for them to you know, accept that what had happened. A lot of guilt, you know, why are we alive? And my, 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 my parents' attitude towards being a Jew really was it's, it's not worth the trouble. That was, that was their attitude. That's what they took away from the Holocaust. Um, um, and then I married an Israeli, a Jew, and I can't say that they were terribly pleased about that. I mean, they weren't you know, against it, but um, so my, my, it wasn't a Jewish upbringing, but I have since become very, very Jewish in a secular way. So tell us the story of how you were uh, stationed in Israel and eventually became Tel Aviv bureau chief for NBC News. Uh, well, I was <coughs> my first, <coughs> the first time I visited Israel was in 68, when I worked on a kibbutz, carrying, working in the, in the bananas, which is like the worst job you can have. Carrying these huge, heavy um, branches of bananas, that was horrible. So that was for a month, and I said, I'm not coming back here again. And then in 73, I was uh, a news cameraman, and I was sent by my company, which is Reuters TV, uh, to work in Israel. So that was a pretty good assignment. I thought, nice and quiet place with the beach and stuff. And then when I arrived there, a week later, Syria and Egypt invaded Israel. So that was my introduction to war. Um, in 74, I met my wife in Israel. She was a, a soldier in the army, sergeant. She was hitchhiking and I picked her up and gave her a lift. And we've been together now for 44 years. Um, so thank you. <laughs> my wife would clap too. I'm not so sure she'd applaud. Um, so, you know, so Israel then, when I was sent there back in 82 as correspondent, um, I joined NBC as a cameraman. I became a producer and a bureau chief and then a correspondent in Israel. That was kind of eye-opening for me because suddenly to be living in Israel with my Israeli wife and my ch children, my three children were all born there. Obviously that made an entirely different connection between me and Israel. I mean, I've suddenly got a stake in the success of Israel. And what I wanted to do as a correspondent, I was very aware of this while I was there, was that you know, Israel's, the media's always been accused of being biased against Israel. And there is some truth to that. Um, but I thought, NBC News, we, this is gonna be a fair reporting of Israel. That, that was important to me to fly that flag, if you like, while I was there for so long. W was there a turning point, a point at which you said, I've gone from just being a correspondent here to really being a part of the fabric of Israeli society, or falling in love with Israel? Falling in love. <laughs> I tell you that, um, I, I, I'll just give you one example of what it was like to be a correspondent and have that attitude, you know, sort of, a, it, was, it was strange because um, you, you're there in order to be objective and I was objective and when I started writing books I did lots of these kind of talks. And for, a lot of people said to me, I didn't know you were Jewish in the beginning, you know, so that, I took that as a compliment to being an objective reporter. Um, but the most difficult part in which I realized there really is a, uh, an issue was when um, in, the, in, the second, in, in the second intifada, when, so we're talking like so 19, 2001 more or less, when 
I, like every other person living in Israel, would send my children to school on the school bus, then they go to the cafe, and, and, um, and I forget whether we spoke about, did, I, did we speak about this before? I forget whether we talked about this in, my, in the other interview. I don't think so. Oh, okay. So um, I didn't want to repeat myself too much. So I would send my kids to school uh, on the bus, then they go to the cafe, then at night they go to the discotheque, and there's, like every other person living in Israel during that suicide bombing period, which lasted about a year and a half, I would kiss the kids in the morning goodbye, and I would say, I think to myself, I never said it aloud, I hope they come back in one piece in the evening. But then, uh, as part of my work, I would then go to the West Bank and find the people who were actually trying to kill the Israelis, including my kids. And I became very familiar in the end with the group of terrorists in the Balata refugee camp in Nablus. Nablus was, the, was the basically the, cent the, the heart of the Intifada, and the Balata refugee camp was the heart of Nablus. And the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades were the people who made the bombs and sent the, and sent the, the terrorists to Israel, the very, very active group. And I became very familiar with them. I was so familiar with them that when the youngest son, Ibrahim, 15 years old, 19 years old at that time, he was shot in the stomach by the Israeli soldiers. When his brothers brought him to their mother's home, to the living room, they fell into the room. I was having tea with his mother. That was the head of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. That's, that's how well I knew them. So, and I, and I was f familiar with them for about two years. I got to know them very well. And um, so there was a real sort of roller coaster of emotions. On the one hand, I'm in the morning, I'm worried about my kids. Then in the afternoon, I go to the West Bank and speak to the people who are actually doing this. Um, and I got to know them so well that at one point, when I, was spent, I spent three nights with the Israeli military who were active in Balata refugee camp. You know, we, were just, we were filming and doing some reporting. And afterwards, the colonel in charge said to me, um, we nearly got them, here's some video. And he showed, he showed me some video of the, 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 uh, uh, this group of Alexa guys being chased across the rooftops. And he said, that's the leader, but he got away. And I said to him, he didn't quite get away because when he jumped down, he broke his leg. And he didn't know that. And I, then I said, oh, I've given him too much information. So it was a real, and then later he said to me, can you introduce me to him? I want to meet the guy, personally. I set it up at a gas station. So I said, oh, that's, I can't do that. <laughs> so in other words, the point was I was very involved with both sides of the story. And that became uh, problematic as a journalist, and, but mostly as a human being. You know, like, whose side am I on here? You know, you know I, I think this is reflected in the book. You've, you've tried to create a book uh, Leon Uris's book, Exodus, is a wonderful book, but it, it paints a certain sort of romanticized view of Israel. This is not necessarily romanticized. You're showing uh, in Promised Land the complexity of the history of Israel with characters who are good, characters who have many faults, uh, issues that, that come up, which were very difficult issues in Israeli society. And I think uh, just from the, the way you describe this, you, you really we're trying to show the complexity that, that you were working out in those early years. No, that's exactly right. That's exactly what I set out to do. I didn't want to write an Exodus kind of book. That's what, so although people compare it, I think they just mean in terms of the, the scope of it. <coughs> it's, it's like a big idea. Um, and, but it's not propaganda. Uh, I mentioned this earlier to some people. The um, Exodus was a book of propaganda, basically. Written in 19, it was published in 1958 after many years of research, is a terrific book. I mean, it's the book that introduced me to, to Israel, probably, and I bet everybody here has read, read Exodus. And wouldn't it be nice if in the 20 years I said, I bet everybody here has read Promised Land. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I doubt it. But the thing about Ben Gurion, when, when, Promised Land, when Exodus came out, said about Exodus, it's a, uh, as a, as a work of literature, Exodus isn't much, but as a piece of propaganda, it's the best thing that ever happened to Israel. And that's true. I mean, everybody was, you know, the world read about Israel th uh, through Exodus. And I, but I don't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to write about the real Israel. I think it's important that as Israel today is under so much pressure from so many areas that we defend Israel or explain Israel from the point of view of reality and the truth, not, re not repeat the myths about how wonderful Israel is. You know, it's, a, it's achieved, Israel's achieved, I think, achieved extraordinary successes. But you can't say it's like a wonderful country. What's a wonderful country mean? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard, it's, it's, had, it's, it's a struggling country, which has done tremendously well, given the circumstances, in, in, in probably in almost 
every field. So I wanted to write about that. So that's what the book is, you know, that it's, it follows a, two brothers, they're flawed characters, it follows their lives in Israel, they fall in love with the same girl. And the book is about, as you know, it's a book about the love, hate, rivalry, jealousy, intrigues of the family set to the background of the struggling young nation. And I wanted that sort of one to play off the other. It's a struggle, it was hard. And um, everybody I spoke to, and I interviewed lots of people for the book, because I, I first of all began it as actually as a non-fiction book. And then, then I decided to turn it into fiction because I think you can really tell the characters of people more through fiction. You can get deep, I feel, you can get deeper into what it's like to be that person in that place at that time through fiction than just interviewing people. Um, so I did a lot of research and nobody I spoke to said it was wonderful or easy. They also emphasized the struggle. And that's what I wanted to emphasize in the book. I think the beauty of the, the fiction format is that you are able to sort of do a composite of uh, all different types of issues and people and kind of make it go in the direction you wanted it to go in order to bring out certain issues. Uh, one issue, for example, that you bring out, uh, one of the protagonists is a Holocaust survivor. Uh, very complicated in the 1950s, the situation for Holocaust survivors. And one of the issues that's brought up is sort of, what did you do in the war? How did you survive? Uh, and in Israeli society, people may look perhaps askance uh, at survivors. How did you survive? Did you do something uh, that, that uh, allowed you to survive? For example, the issue of, of Kapos, um, which is brought out in the book. Maybe talk a little bit about uh, that, that issue in Israeli society in the 1950s. Well, I, wanted to, I, I actually wanted to write more. I, I mentioned the Kapos, and it comes up a little bit. I actually, when I did the research for the book, wanted to write a lot about the Kapos, because there were the trials, the very important period in Israel's history when they were starting to put these people on trial um, and, and pursue them, and it was very, you know. Um, but in the end, I didn't write about the Kapos much, because you should say that the, the Kapos were Jewish guards in, uh, in the camps. Yeah, who were seen as collaborators with the Nazis in some cases, in many cases. Um, but I, in the end, I didn't want to write about that too much because it was too, um, uh, I don't know, it, it, it took the book in a different direction. Um, although it's a real, a, real, a real issue. And yeah, so the character, one of the two brothers, one of the brothers gets sent to America, is lucky in 37 and, and he survives. He lives with the American family, everything's okay with him. The rest of the family gets sent to the concentration camps and Arya turns up, survives, and the two brothers meet again in Palestine. And the story, the book tells their story. But Arya is a very damaged figure. Um, he hard, sh hard elbows, difficult personality, demanding, wants to get rich at any cost. And um, I've met, you know, we all, probably everybody here knows survivors and met many survivors. And um, one of the things that I always, that always strikes me is that whenever um, a survivor tells his story, the people who are listening say, that's incredible. You should write a book about your life. Um, and the fact is that it, it, they've all got extraordinary stories because if they didn't have an extraordinary story, they'd be dead. So, um, but the story that, the reason many of them don't want to talk about it was for many reasons, it was just too hard. But also, you know, if you survive many years in different camps, you know, it, 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 there's a reason you were able to do that. If there's one scrap of potato peel, you better get that scrap of potato peel. And some got it more often than others and lived, and others didn't. And there were all kinds of people did all kinds of horrific things to survive, so no wonder they didn't want to talk about it. Um, and so that's my character area in the book. I, all of my characters are basically, they're not, they're, not, they're not based on anybody I know, but they, I try to make them as authentic as I can. And so he's a damaged person, and, uh, but he does good things. In the same way as the good, the good guy, Peter, does bad things. We're all like that, especially you. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly good. <laughs> all right, so another issue that you bring out is um, this uh, sort of um, dichotomy between the Jews from Europe and the Jews from the Middle East and how that was playing out in Israeli society in the 50s and 60s, also quite difficult. Yeah, I mean, I try to weave through the book the key issues of the period. And in the second and third books that will follow the, tr the trilogy, you know, the issues will change, as they did change. So one of the key issues in the early days is much less of an issue today, of course, as you all know, is the Ashkenazi-Sephardic divide. 
And so that, so in order to emphasize that, which, is, which was a very important part of that period, the first 20 years of Israel's life, um, the two brothers come from Germany. They're the Ashkenazi Jews, and they fall in love with the same girl who's a Jewish refugee from Egypt. She's a Sephardi, and her family are, are there with her. So, um, I mean, it's quite remarkable. It, I begin the book in 1950. Well, there's a prologue in 1937, but the book picks up in 1950, Deliberately, I didn't want to write about the same period that Exodus covered, the, 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 the War of Independence and the immediate aftermath, because everybody writes about that. What people are not less familiar with is, well, so how did you actually build the country? That was my question. What did you do? I mean, how, how did you build a country from nothing? Surrounded by enemies, fighting in wars in 48 and 56 and 67 and 73. It's the same generation of people who went, survived the camps. One out of four Israeli soldiers who died in the War of Independence were Holocaust survivors. So think of those people who went to, to Palestine, then joined the army, and then Israel. And then on the other hand, think of the other group, which, we, which at the time were pretty much, uh, I wouldn't say despised, but were demeaned, were the Jews who came from the Arab countries. When I begin the book in 1950, it's the coldest winter in, in the history of the region, the recorded history of the region, 1950. <clears throat> and yet one in four Israelis were living in tents at the time in freezing conditions. Um, and they were almost all refugees from Arab countries. So that story hasn't been told enough. So that's what I wanted to get into. I wanted to weave that story. And there were other issues that I get into the book, too. Yeah, I, I certainly found myself many points in the book saying I, I really had no idea, or I, I never thought about this. It just never occurred to me. We, we tend to only uh, focus on, on little bits of, of history and not sort of the full sweep like that. I'm glad you say that because that's one of, the, one of the, when I was, obviously when you're writing a book about 20 years of Israel's history in, in 400 pages or whatever it is, you have to leave out a lot. And what I wanted to do was, was write about the issues that are less well known. I want people to respond exactly as you just did. Thank you. Uh, I wanted people to say, oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, you, you certainly succeeded. I, I tell you a character that I really liked. Perhaps it's not... Uh, the character that people point to the most, but Tamara's father, so the, the, uh, the woman from Egypt that these, the two protagonists were in love with, her father was um, a man who, who lost his status, essentially, when he came to Israeli society. He seemed on the verge of leaving, very upset, and then suddenly he found his calling. He, he, uh, he had an innate ability, and that was the fact that he spoke Arabic, he understood the Middle Eastern mentality, and he became a sought-after advisor and commentator on the news that, that everybody wanted to hear from. Yeah, well, first of all, obviously, I, I didn't know Israel in that period. But writing about Moshe, that character, um, who changed his name to Moshe from Moise in, in, in Egypt, um, what was very enjoyable for me, because I understood through the Ethiopian migration what it was like to be, to be a migrant in those days, a different generation, because the, the Ethiopian Jews, when they came from Ethiopia, were immediately totally confused by the new world they were in. And as usual in, in those kind of immigrations, uh, the older people who were, who were revered as the, 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 the dispensers and owners of wisdom at home, suddenly became why like they couldn't speak the language, they couldn't do anything, and they depended on the young generation to translate, and so they were marginalized. So the Ethiopian suicide rate, for instance, among the Ethiopian migrants into Israel was, by, was about something like 10 times the national rate. There's a lot of suicide among Ethiopian immigrants. Anyway, that helped me understand what it must have been like for Moshe. And I wanted, him, I wanted Moshe to be the sort of the voice of wisdom because they were so, um, they, they were so disenfranchised. They lost their voice so strongly, this generation. Um, and yet they had so much to offer. Their entire, you know, um, knowledge base uh, was not was missed so he was a professor in, in the book professor of arabic literature and classical and classical um, arabic so he's looking for a job in in israel in 1952 <laughs> what does a guy like that do to get a job in 1950 51 52 he says well i teach arabic um, he's a professor in cairo university he was so but in israel at the time the response from the ministry of education and when he went to look for jobs was we don't we don't want to, we don't want to teach Arabic in our schools we don't teach Hebrew in our schools, so he was he, he didn't he, he you know so he finally he became a journalist, and then he was and then a commentator on on Arab Israeli affairs, and because he has such a deep background knowledge he becomes very sought after 
becomes an analyst at Mossad on the Middle East desk. And then, I think he does, doesn't he? I forget now. <laughs> I think he does. And then he becomes, you know, a, a, treasure, a treasured, revered old, uh, older man. And I, and I think that was a very true journey yeah. for people like that. So what's, what's missing from the book, though, are the Arabs, the Israeli Arabs, which uh, today are 20% of Israeli society. I, I don't know what they were back in the 1950s. Um, why the absence? Uh, they were always about the same percentage, 17, 18, 19, 20%. Um, in 48 and still today. Well, because the, the first 20 years of Israel's existence, the Arabs who lived in Israel played almost no role in the building of the state. They were marginalized, they were exploited. If they wanted something, then they had to give something in return. If they wanted to leave the village to go to school or to go to the Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, uh, they had to get the permission of the imam or of the, or of the city leader, sector leader who were always um, under the sway of the Shin Bet, the Secret Service. So if an Arab Israeli wanted something, he had to give something. And that was normally information about, his, about the fellow village members. So they didn't play much of a role. And it, that's why they're not mentioned in the book much. The other issues were there. After 67, the, the Arab question became much more important. And that, that, that I'll deal with that in book two. And they played a bigger role, presumably? Yeah. Just, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's right. All right, so let's, um, let's talk about the Mossad. So the other protagonist is uh, an intelligence agent for the Mossad, and uh, the book is set in, uh, while it's a work of fiction, it's set in historical context. Presumably, all of these historical details are correct. Again, I was learning a lot, and I, you, know, you focus on the capture of Adolf Eichmann, but you don't think about all of the efforts of the Mossad uh, throughout the 50s and 60s to capture Nazis and, and to put the Nazis to the service of the State of Israel. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Well, capturing Nazis was never a great priority for the, Isra for the Israeli government. They were just more concerned about surviving and defeating the enemies they had. Um, so Peter, the character, again, his journey is very authentic. So he was sent in 37, one of the guys lucky enough, children lucky enough to be sent to America and live with a family in Wisconsin, escape the Holocaust goes back to Europe with the American army. As a, um, because he speaks German, joins the OSS, the precursor of, of the CIA. Then goes to Palestine, joins the precursor of Mossad, and becomes a Mossad agent, and rises within the organization. And the, some of the key elements, the key issue he's, he's, he's involved with, with Mossad, was the key issue of the time, which was to stop Egypt developing ground-to-ground -ground rockets. Um, so in the same way as today, Israel was very concerned about the Iranian nuclear bomb and had assassination campaigns and intimidation campaigns and all kinds of campaigns to, to stop Iran getting the bomb. In the 50s and early 60s, they were doing exactly the same thing with Egypt to stop them developing the military and getting these, um, building these rockets. So Egypt, um, in order to, to develop the military, um, hired uh, 150 former Nazi military people, including SS, SS leaders and scientists as well. And so Israel's campaign, uh, in reality, was through intimidation and letter, letter bombs and, and assassinations to, to get those Egyptians, to, to get the Germans to leave Egypt. Um, in the end, one of the ways they did it, the most successful, was simply get the German government to develop scientific programs in Germany and offer these scientists more money to work in Germany than in Egypt. That's actually what happened. And, and uh, until then, they were killing them, or trying to kill them. So Peter, my, my character, is involved with that whole process. So the background uh, of what, it, what was important for Israel at the time is very accurate. And I just sort of weave my character through, through, this, through the stories. So the final issue I'm going to raise is um, what I would call the hell of war. Uh, you really present that in 56 and 67. Uh, again, in such a detailed way that I perhaps had not, uh, had not thought about. Uh, one of the characters uh, leaves a life of luxury, uh, he, this, this Holocaust survivor. Uh, he's on reserve duty, and he has uh, horrific experiences in both of those wars. Yeah, and um, in the 67 war, um, actually, all, all of the things that happened to him happened to friends of mine. So for instance, when he was in a, in, a, in a tank that was hit by three rockets, a friend of mine was in a tank that was hit by three rockets. And, uh, and he did, and he did um, survive, and others were killed. 
But when he described what it was like, the flash of light inside and the, all the sort of the sharp edge bits of you know, ammunition boxes and teacups, you know, flying around inside, uh, that was what it was like. And he, and as Aria did, he, he, he was able to get out. So my friend actually had to, ended up with 60 percent first degree burns, which normally would kill you, but he survived, and became an and this particular person became a war hero in the seventy three. I can tell you that story. Right, amazing character. He, he won that Israel's highest medal for valor in seventy three. Even though he survived in sixty seven in the most horrific way, he still had it in him to do what he did. Um, but in the book, it something else happens. Um, so yeah, so I mean, again, I want to, as a journalist, I want things to be as authentic as possible. And that, I, I think that the authenticity of my career as a journalist, um, basically making a career out of meeting people on the worst day of their lives, helped me as a writer of fiction. Because the storytelling techniques, if you like, that I developed in TV, I find, transfer very much into writing fiction. Because you, know, you can tell as much as you like about what someone's doing and what they're like, but you really need to show it. And it's that little intimate detail that may be unexpected that really tells you something about the characters. And that's what I try to write in fiction. And, and I think you made a lot of decisions in there that uh, really tried to get across things where you, were, you, you had looked at a detail and said, I'm going to use this in a very particular way. So for example, we were talking about the uh, 1967 and the tank. You know, the, that story ultimately ended up with Gaza. I think many stories about 1967 talk about the West Bank and, and uh, the, the opening of the West Bank for, uh, for Israelis going in. I mean, these are the kinds of stories you hear. You don't hear very much about Gaza. You tried to bring to life the situation in Gaza in 1967, and I thought that that was a very important detail that you, uh, you, you zeroed in on. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, that's right. I mean, that's, I, again, I did that on purpose. Because we, exactly as you say. And I think it sowed the seeds also for uh, the future conflict that now exists with Gaza to, to this day. Yeah. Um, and the interesting thing was after they, they captured Gaza, there was a big discussion about what are we going to do with it? Um, they weren't supposed to actually, in, in the war plan in 67, they weren't supposed to go into Gaza. Um, and as a matter of fact, the, the guy that I just told you about, the friend of mine, he was the first tank into Rafah in the southern part of Gaza. And then he, that's when he got hit and got burned. Um, so, and and uh, you know, that was not part of their orders. At the last minute, they were told, you know, we, we got it, it's there, take it. And so that was, a, that was a field decision to take Gaza, and they got stuck with it, didn't they? <laughs> and so what's your opinion about the disengagement from Gaza? Did you think that that was the right thing to do in 2005? Uh, in 2005, I yes, I thought it was the right thing to do, same as I thought leaving Lebanon was the right thing to do. In both cases, it simply left the field free for the, for the other side to fill the, the vacuum. I mean, the, the naivete of the, of the Israelis in one sense, when they left those, all those um, um, the greenhouses, thinking, oh, that's going to be, that, that's gonna be that'll, that'll set up the, the future agriculture of Gaza. And instead, they just, the Palestinians just destroyed them rather than inherit the, the Israeli gift, if you like. Uh, that, that said a lot. I mean, that said right away that this was not going to be a... Uh, the, end, the end of it, taking out every last Jew from Gaza was not the end of it, and it was clear almost immediately that it wouldn't be the end of it. And, and, and again, uh, that's part of the lesson I feel that I've learned you know, over the years of reporting from there, that um, giving, giving things, this is a hard, I mean, it sounds a very negative, pessimistic viewpoint, and I used to be very extremely optimistic, but I'm not anymore. Um, the the Palestinians don't want to accept Israel's existence, and however much, however deep, however, however toward them you go, you won't bring them to your side. I still believe that, nevertheless, we have to make every effort, and that has to be the that has to be the policy of Israel: is to make life better for the Palestinians, regardless of whether or not it makes them appreciate Israel more. That's not really the point. The point is they should have a better life, and then over time things will change through education. But as long as they're in the role, in the position they are now, things will never improve. And the proof of that was just last week, when Israel finally allowed in more uh, fuel, d diesel, diesel, and um, and what else? The construction material. Um, th that more was electricity. Partly, I'm sorry. More electricity, more hours of electricity. Yeah, it went up from four hours a day to to like eight or ten. 
oh, so this is going to make things better. Meanwhile, the next, next Friday, there were more Palestinians at the fence demonstrating than the month before. So it's not about, you know, you're not going to make them love you. But there are values according to which we have to live. Tell us about the kind of research that goes into doing a book like this. Oh, <laughs> there was a lot of research. I mean, first of all, I knew the story well anyway. As I mentioned earlier, when I, I, I began this book as a work of nonfiction. Well, I, well, um, I began the book as a, you know Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation? So I began thinking, oh, I'm going to do a book about what I consider to be the world's real greatest generation, which is the Jewish generation from Europe in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, tw in the 20s, born in the, in the 20s. Tom's generation was his father's generation, born in the Depression, fighting Nazism, uh, fighting communism, the Korean War, and building America. Compare that to what the generation from Europe lived through. The, born in the Depression, living in Germany, in the, in the growing strength of Hitler and the anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, some survived the Holocaust, living in DP camps, displaced people's camps in, in, in Germany, for many for a year or two, then making their way illegally, mostly, to Palestine, joining the army. And what a life, what a life of these people. Um, every year got worse. Then one in four of them died, of the soldiers died were Holocaust survivors. The war in 48, the war in 56, in 67, then they're building a country from almost nothing into a very powerful country already by 67. I mean, think of the life of these people, the life, the, you know, what they went through as a generation. You know, compared to me in London, growing up in, born in 1947 in London, until today, the only th pressure I've ever had is to get a bigger car and a nicer house. I mean, what have we done except work and, and collect stuff? Compared to that generation of our, of our parents, my parents and their families. I mean, it's extraordinary what this generation lived through. And so that's what I wanted to write about. So I, I wanted to write a book like Tom's about the greatest generation. I figured if he sold five million, I should sell a million. <laughs> but then I thought, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think you, you can tell the truth more um, through fiction, I believe, than non-fiction. So in the end, I didn't want to write about the history of Israel. I wanted to write the story of Israel. So that's what the promise landed. All right, so let, let's broaden that issue. Many people feel that the media is biased against Israel. You obviously represented the media for many years. Um, double standards, uh, not focusing on the positive stories, et cetera. Do you think that, that the mainstream media is generally biased against Israel? There is bias in the mainstream media against Israel. Uh, it's not the bias of individuals and their reporting, though. Um, although there may well be examples of that, you know. And as I, uh, you know, I, I was at lunch. I said I, I was at lunch yesterday with two fairly prominent Israeli writers and the Jewish American writers and thinkers. And I asked them both, "Is the New York Times biased against Israel?" I asked them both, and they immediately said, "Of course it is." So okay, so you probably know a lot more about the New York Times than I do. Um, and I was at the BBC, so. There are many examples of bias against Israel. But, and it's very important, there is no, I would say, there is no media bias against Israel. There may be a bias to certain individuals. But think about what it takes to make us put a story in the New York Times. There's a reporter in the field who's probably working in his, in his New York Times bureau with Israeli researchers and help assistants and Palestinians too. Then the, he writes his story, it goes to, to, through a couple of editors in New York, Another editor would choose the headline. Somebody else takes the pictures. Another one chooses the pictures. So if the story in the end comes out as it's biased against Israel, what, they're all biased against Israel? Of course not. Um, so why, why does it appear that way? So I think the real bias against Israel is actually a phrase, bias against understanding. And we have to understand that. First of all, I've been asked this question in every single talk I've ever given on any book in the last 10 years. It always comes up, every single time. Is the media biased against Israel? And so last month, I thought, I better really work out what my answer is, because I've never given a satisfactory answer. And so the truth about the bias against Israel is that in the West, the way we tell stories, within that way of telling stories, is a bias against understanding. And that works against the interests of specifically Israel. And what I mean is this. What is a story on, in the newspaper or television or anywhere? 
It's something dramatic and that is different and new. Could have those three conditions. And what is dramatic and different and new is usually something that's happening very suddenly. It's a bomb, it's an earthquake, it's a, it's a hurricane, something that's happening suddenly. Um, so in Israel, that happens a lot. War, bombs, you know, terror attacks. So whenever you read a story about Israel, it's usually going to be about it's in news coverage. I'm talking about news coverage, I'm not talking about background reporting. It's usually about something bad happening. And so people take away from their, people are not thinking so much about Israel or anything else, just reading the paper. They take away from that, Israel's a bad, dangerous place. People are always calling me up and saying, is it safe for my child to visit Israel? Um, so what we in the West consider a story, which is something dramatic and sudden and different and new, um, happens in Israel a lot. It's usually to do with violence, and so therefore the understanding of Israel is as a bad, violent place. Actually, that's exactly why I did the book Walking, Walking Israel. It's exactly why I walked along the coast of Lebanon to Gaza, to tell, and then to, to tell the this story. This was your, your second book. My second book called Walking Israel, which won the National Jewish Book Award, which was, uh, I wanted to tell a different story about Israel, not the usual story of conflict, which is what you see if you take the north-south line of the, green, of the green line. But if you walk along the coast, you see a completely different peaceful country, for the most part. So that's what I wanted to write about, because there is a bias against Israel, but it's not an individual bias. It's just not feasible that every one of those people I mentioned in the chain of writing a story, from the reporter to the person who chooses the picture and the headline, they can't all be biased against Israel. They're not. I know they're not, of course they're not. But the story selection uh, involves a bias against understanding, which works to the disadvantage of Israel. And um, who you choose to interview, and if it's say, for instance, at the BBC, when I was at the B when I was at the BBC, I was part of a group that was just that analysed coverage about Israel for the BBC. Part of the bias is not only the story you tell or how you write it; it's who you choose to interview. And in this particular, it was quite remarkable. The Israeli, the pro-Israeli analysts or representatives on the BBC radio, um, who were talking about Israel, were interrupted by the interviewer at a rate of four or five times the amount that the pro-Arab commentator was interrupted. They interrupted the pro-Israeli much more than the pro-Arab guy. That's a kind of bias. They, they're aggressive and uh, you know, not taking for granted what they're saying, giving more time to the Arab view. So those are the areas of bias. It's not, you know, it's not about the guy in the field who doesn't like Israel. It's got nothing to do with it. What do you consider to be the biggest internal threat to the state of Israel? Now that, for me, that's an easy one, the Haradim. And I don't say that with any objection to what they believe. I think that they're free to believe what they want. But their role in Israeli political life is so, um, is so uh, uh, out of proportion to their numbers, even though the numbers are huge now, over a million now. Um, I think that, that, that the th true threat to Israel is not from the Arab armies, and it's pretty clear, or, Ira or the Iranian army. It's the threat, it's the, it's, the, it's the decline in Americans' support for Israel which may not be happening very quickly now. But the more the Haradim have power in Israel, the more Israel appears to be a, an ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish state, the harder it's going to be for Americans and others to support Israel. And I think Israel, without, Israel, without American support, Israel is finished. So that's the true threat, is that I mean, the Haradim could be as active and as numerous as they like, but the country's got to stay more secular if it's going to maintain American support. That's my personal belief. So part of maintaining American support is the next generation. And if I can uh, relay an issue that I hear uh, perhaps more often than, than most, and, and definitely more and more, it's the issue of what's going on on college campuses today. Uh, really, it's, it's a matter of winning the hearts and minds of the next generation. Perhaps the next generation doesn't think about Israel, but they're hearing such, uh, such negativity about Israel, and they, they hear that Israel is a, a state that needs to be boycotted. They hear that it's an apartheid state. You were, you were posted in South Africa. You were posted in South Africa during the apartheid era. What's your response when you hear somebody accuse Israel of being an apartheid state? Um, well, first of all, I lived there for four years in Rhodesia, as it then was, and then South Africa. So I lived under Rhodesian form of apartheid and the South African form of apartheid. So, so for four years, I was, I was living the life. So I don't, when, when, 
and, and I know that on, on, his, on American campuses, Hillel and other organizations are under real pressure. And also, by the way, probably as, as you know, uh, with your children or your grandchildren are probably facing all this. So it's a very real, real issue. Uh, but the question of apartheid and Israel, I, I wouldn't even engage. My, my, my response to people screaming about apartheid, we just don't engage with them. Because the minute people compare Israel to apartheid, you know right away the quality of the person you're talking to. You're never going to persuade him that Israel is not an apartheid state. It's got that. And apartheid state, he probably doesn't even understand what an apartheid state really is. Um, Israel, is Israel is actually a state which, you know, which guarantees equality. And this is very real equality for Israeli Arabs. Doesn't mean they're all happy in Israel, but they have very real equality in Israel in all fields. And in areas where, you, where it's debatable, for instance, can an Arab buy a house next to mine in Tel Aviv? Yes, he can. Can he buy it in Herzliya Betuach? As far as I know, never been done. Sort of, you know, sort of tacit, tacit uh, uh, racism. But by the same token, I can't buy a house in an Arab village. No Jew can, or very few. There are only a couple of, you know, a couple of, uh, couple of you know, uh, Abu Ghosh on the way to Jerusalem, Jews and Arabs live together. But even in towns where there's, where they're like Haifa, um, Jaffa, Akko, where Jews and Arabs share the towns, very clear division between where the groups live. But I, you know, so for the most part, Jews can't buy in Arab towns or villages. You certainly can't buy a place in a Druze place or move in there. So it's, it's, it works in both directions. But again, apartheid is it's just a trigger, it's a slogan. And really, in, in reality, meaningless in the Israeli context, but a useful weapon if you hate Israel. So uh, I know you said that you're not so optimistic, but uh, perhaps there are some optimistic signs, not necessarily with the Palestinians, but, uh, but looking further afield. Uh, Israel, um, or Prime Minister Netanyahu has made trips to uh, South America, to Africa. Uh, tell us about your, uh, your feelings about Israel and its, its I mean, UN resolutions aside, how Israel is being accepted now on the world stage. Well, first of all, I'm pessimistic only about the likely success of a peace process with the Arabs. That's what I'm pessimistic about. Israel is an amazing place. Israel today has never been stronger militarily, economically, strategically. The enemies have never been weaker around it. I mean, who, who threatens Israel apart from Iran getting a bomb? Um, so. Israel has actually never been stronger, and, and I see from my own life and the lives of my friends in Israel how good their life is. Um, and there's a slightly misleading statistic. The OECD says that the, the Israeli, um, Israeli children are among the poor, among, are actually have the highest rate of poverty in the OECD, the Organization of what is it, European Economic, whatever it is, the, the, you know, the, basically the, the Organization of Developed Western Economic States. I forget what it stands for. Israel has the highest proportion of children living in poverty. But it's a misleading statistic because a lot of that poverty is almost voluntary. The, the, the Orthodox Jewish community that, doesn't, that only wants to study and lives for the most part on, on, on grants, um, are vol you know, they're the voluntary poor. I have a friend who lives in Kriyat Arba. He's got 12 children. I went there once. I said, what do you feed your kids for dinner? How do you feed 12 kids? They're all eating cornflakes for dinner. Um, and so there's that group, which is actually the voluntary poor. And that's among the Arabs too. There's a large part of the Arab population that doesn't want to work, or they, or they can't get good jobs, or the women don't work. A large numbers of women don't work. So, so the, it, 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 it does have that you know, depressing statistic, but it doesn't tell the true story of Israel. And I think a lot of the objections to Israel don't tell the true story of Israel. Um, there are real problems. Um, but anybody who, who visits Israel can see how extraordinary growth in the, in the infrastructure, trains, roads, TV stations, I mean, it's extraordinary. The building everywhere. So Israel's in a wonderful position. I'm not pessimistic about Israel at all. I'm pessimistic about its chance of being accepted in the region. But in terms of its, um, you know, the, the outreach to more Arab states now, um, that's extraordinary. I mean, that's very important. But of course, it's based on the Arab states' interests. And in that if the Sunni states want Israel to help them in the confrontation with Iran, so they need each other. So as long as they need each other, great. But how long will that last for? 
probably a long, long time, because Iran won't be defeated so quickly. Another thing I think is that the, the let's say Iran gets a nuclear bomb. What are they going to do with it? It's not like they're going to drop it on Israel. It just means that Israel is more, you know, has to consider that. Iran, there, there were three wars between Iran, uh, between India and Pakistan, around, about Kashmir. As soon as both got the nuclear bomb, it's, it's all been negotiations ever since. So, you know, mad, mutually assured destruction. It, it worked in Europe, it works in India and Pakistan. Maybe it's not a bad thing if Iran, I'm not saying it's a good thing if Iran gets the bomb, but we don't have to be terrified about it. All right, we're uh, going to go to questions. Going back to your point about bias in the, in, in the news, and I, I can accept your point that the journalists in the field are telling the story and they're not biased, but I still cringe when I read the paper and look at those headlines and feel like somebody made a decision to skew the cause and the effect. So the IDF kills five teenagers at the border who were trying to destroy and you know, kill 100 people. So um, I've got to think that the blame must lie in the person who's writing the headlines. Well, and, and the people who approve the headline, because the whole, you know, it's always, everything's done by group. So um, look, okay, so another aspect of the answer about bias is that another definition of bias is that anybody who's, who says something that I don't agree with is biased. You know, I mean, the Palestinians, um, like Thomas, Thomas Freeman, he, he, he said, the Arabs, the Arabs hate me, the Jews hate me, the Israelis hate me, I must be doing something right. I think if they all hate you, you're probably doing something wrong. So I think there is a question to be asked. It's a good question, and there's certain headlines do appear biased. I absolutely agree with that. And, uh, but I don't believe that that's uh, the, the newspaper policy. Um, and, and I'm not sure how many, news, uh, how many headlines that appear biased to you, because they may not appear biased to somebody else, a Palestinian business, and who will also read the newspaper, the same newspaper. Um, I'm not sure how many he biased headlines you, s you have to see before you say the paper's biased. Is it three out of 10, is it nine out of 10? How many headlines appear biased? I don't know, I mean, I don't follow the New York Times that closely. When I was at the BBC, I felt the BBC was biased against Israel. Um, and they were, it was, it was clear. Um, what was so the definition? In the BBC? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, first of all, they were, they were absolved of bias, of course, everybody, they, all the reports said they're not biased. It was clear to me they were biased, and I was helping write the story, write the write the write, write the, the stories. Um, I, well, I, I, it's, it's a very difficult subject. This is, I, I personally, I guess bias would be the opposite of objective, but I don't believe in objectivity, even though that's I was a journalist. I, what I tried to do is was be as fair as I could to both sides. I, I just believed in fairness, because what I was a field reporter, that's what I loved, and I always did that. I went and I met the people on the both sides, and my goal was to tell that person's story <laughs> as fairly as I could. So what made the BBC in your mind biased? What was your well, it wasn't, it, 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 compare it to Fox today. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the, the journalism of the people in the field. It was the editorializing in the, in the uh, commentary programs and BBC's got lots of them. And so bias is not only, it, it begins with what story are we gonna cover today on the news? Who are we gonna invite to talk about it? Um, and there was a clear bias in the BBC on most of the programs that I was listening to of the quality of the people they interviewed on the pro-Arab side and the quality of the people on the pro-Israel side. They would interview these wonderful professors of, of Arabic and, and very good writers and analysts then they'd have a couple of Joe Schmoes from the Jewish side who couldn't express themselves. And then they would be interrupted all the time by the, by the interviewers. So that was clear bias to me. But reporting from the field during the war, for instance, um, there's another kind of bias. But again, I always emphasize that it's not the bias of the individual reporters. I mean, I know them all. You know, you can't say so and so biased against Israel. But there are other aspects of play all the time. One of them, for instance, during the last war in Gaza, when was that, 2014, I think it was, uh, was um, that whole issue about is the media reporting the fact that Hamas and the other Islamic Jihad and the others are, are, are shooting rockets from inside school courtyards 
in alleys next to hospitals? Is the media reporting that? And I went to war with NBC about that, um, which may explain why I don't work there after 2014. But, <laughs> but, but, I, but I, 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 I took them to task about that because we were not reporting that. It was, it was critically important information. Because that's what Israel was saying. We're attacking, we're hitting schools by mistake, but what do you want from us? They're firing rockets from 10 yards, five yards from the school, sometimes in the courtyard. I mean, the Hamas headquarters in Gaza during the entire war was in the basement of the Shifa hospital in Gaza, the main hospital. So what do you do with that? You can bomb the hospital? No, of course not. But so um, Israel was getting, was getting a terrible press because of hitting schools and hitting buildings but the, the journalists were not reporting the facts that these were being, the rockets were being fired in them. As a matter of fact, when the war was over and the Indian journalist was back in Mumbai and Italians were back in Rome, then they said, we couldn't report this at the time, but, and at the time, I was saying to NBC, we've got to report this. And NBC said, no, it'll put our people in danger. And I had this whole thing going back and forth with NBC. Um, and I've kept, the, I've kept the e chain in case anybody reports this in the papers tomorrow. So, um, they basically ignored what I said. You know, they said we're not. They're not. We're going to. We, I said if you either stop, either tell the truth or don't report from Gaza. But if it's too dangerous, pull the people out. But if you're going to be there, you've got to say we're not able to report the whole story. And they never did that. You don't have to go so back. I, to I think that's. I, so I'm not saying that's bias. I'm not sure what that is. It's, it, it's, it's bad journalism, is what it is. You don't have to go back to 2014. I mean, look at the uh, the Gaza protests from the spring and the, and the summer with all of the breaches of the border with weapons, and I'm not exactly sure what the international community was expecting the soldiers to do. Um, again, again I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to talk about stuff I don't really know about, and, and I don't know what the international headlines were or how they treated that story. Um, I, th I, th I thought the reporting that I saw on the three networks and the cable here, I thought it was pretty accurate. I mean, I was... Uh, you can't, every time there's something happening, you can't always mention the entire background. I thought it was, I thought it was pretty fair. Somebody said to me that we're not reporting the balloons, the firing, the... the, 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 the incendiary the, kites. Incendiary kites, excuse me. And balloons, well, whatever. And balloons, yeah. yeah. Um, why aren't you reporting that? You know, this is, this is terrible. To, well, you know, how many people were killed by incendiary kites or burning balloons? I think nobody. The Israeli Forestry Commission said that more fires were more fire more land was lost to fire through forest fires than, than were damaged by those in that war. So there's no real reason to report it. I mean, it's interesting to report because that's a sort of a novel form of warfare or a, or a conflict. But in the same period, how many people were killed in, in Syria that we didn't talk about? In, in, in Yemen, um, I think something like 80,000 children have died of, star of, of hunger of hunger in a small country of Yemen in the last few years. This is a major story. So are we going to be worried about a few burning kites that sort of burn the fields of people? I don't think so. That's my response to that. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, the risk that separates uh, the Haredim and the secular population in Israel, do you see that as a uh, significant risk for uh, a dissolution of, of a democracy in Israel? So a risk for the dissolution of democracy? Yes. No, I don't. I think Israel is a very strong country, and they'll, it'll, it'll, it'll work itself out somehow. Um, I mean, the, the Haredim are working through democratic means to improve, to extend their power. And uh, in terms of the secular, they're extremely effective. And um, even, you know, Hensley Pituach in Israel? It, it's like sort of the smart residential area where the diplomats live and all that stuff and me, um, and so th this is a very upmarket area, and there's one, there's one ultra-Orthodox Jew, a very rich man, who's buying up lots of property, Bank Lumi closed on the main, one of the main squares, and he bought that up and turned it, now it's a little synagogue. And so that's what they're doing throughout the country, they're extending their influence through money and power and religion, and all power to them, they're doing it democratically, and if, if in the end there's more of them, they can wield more power. Um, that's democracy, but I think, I think, I think Haradim, ultimately I think the Haradim will change because the young Haradim are not accepting uh, all of the, the, the strictures of their parents. There's a, quite a strong move um, away, not necessarily becoming, uh, rejecting orthodoxy, or well, many will do, but many other people become orthodox, but um, they're no longer accepting the automatic 
impose your own poverty. Um, they want, but I'm generalizing like crazy, of course. Um, but many Haredim young people now want to work. They want to join the army. They want to go to university and study. And that's partly probably from the inter because of the internet. So the young Haredim are changing. Um, it doesn't mean they're less orthodox, but I think they, they, they no longer want to be poor. I think that's quite an important part of it, uh, part of the, of the change. So although there may well be many more orthodox uh, Haredim, what a Hared is may change. I'm just being uh, optimistic. I think the danger of that secular, um, the secular Haredi dispute is very dangerous and bitter on a local level, like in, in, um, in Beit Shan. Um, not, not in Beit Shan, I wasn't, my mind gone blank, on the way to, on the way to, to, to Beit Shemesh. Beit Shemesh, yeah. excuse me, yeah, but, uh, Beit Shemesh. Um, you know, this sort of spitting at the secular people and then people kicking, kicking girls who don't dress properly and, uh, you see, a lot, you see a lot of that, and um, we and you you hear those stories. They're so again, it fits the definition of news. It's a great story when a, when a, an, an Orthodox person uh, stops the bus on the way to Jerusalem and, and forces the secular woman to go to the back of the bus, and then the bus stops because the bus driver refuses to continue in those circumstances. And these kinds of incidents happen all the time, and of course they all get reported. Um, but I think that the real story is that the is that that which makes them different is being weakened. I mean, why do they dress the way they do? They dress the way they do specifically to look different, so that their children, the young people, will not be absorbed into the into the regular population. That's why they dress in that way. Um, is a strong part of the reason why they dress that way, and that's changing. So. It is a major threat, and as I said earlier, I think I think it's a threat to the existence of Israel, ultimately because of the lack of the great, the, the lack, the decline in support for Israel. But it's also possible that the, being a Hared, a Hared will change. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Scott. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.